All right, another week, it's question show time. Your questions, my answers. Again, I've got a special guest answerer. Tim Dodd from Everyday Astronaut is going to tackle a question about Crew Dragon and the Starliner, so stick around for that. All right, let's get into your questions. Lexington 476. We always hear about the late heavy bombardment, but was there also an early heavy bombardment, a late light bombardment, or an early light bombardment? Good question, right? Why is it the late heavy bombardment? Does that mean that there were a bunch of other ones? Uh, no, no, there was just the, well, there was like at the beginning of the solar system, there was the period where all of the objects in the solar system all came together and crashed into each other and formed the planets and mostly cleared out the material in the solar system. So whatever planets you had were done. But around 4 billion years ago, uh, there was this period where the various giant planets in the solar system moved around and this sort of, you know, Jupiter and Saturn pushed inward, Uranus and Neptune pushed outward, flipped places. And it was during that time, they think, that as Jupiter pushed in, it sort of went into the asteroid belt and scattered a big chunk of the asteroid belt and just emptied it out. And that's why we saw this period of bombardment, sort of this secondary period, hitting the moon and hitting the earth and causing a whole bunch more <laughs> rubble and wreckage and, and damage. And also was the time that scooped up some of these rocks that sent them to the moon. So. Uh, I love how you put that, and that's why they call it the late heavy bombardment, because they wouldn't have expected to be more bombardment after the solar system had, had originally formed, but there was a time when it got worse for a while. Again, Ilguri, oxygen-rich environment of the Earth? Hang on, there was little to no oxygen on Earth 4 billion years ago. This is sort of following on to the episode that I just did about the Earth rock that was found on the moon and brought back by the Apollo 14 astronauts and I had a bunch of people mention this. And of course, when this, you, I don't know if you remember the part, the rock was formed 20 kilometers under the Earth's surface at a place where um, there was no atmosphere. But the thing is that lava is 46% oxygen. Like, Earth is mostly made of oxygen. It's just that life, after billions of years, created an atmosphere that had a lot of oxygen, but just Earth itself has tons of oxygen in it. The, the key, sort of the distinguishing feature was that the exact kind of rock that was made on, the, the kinds of rocks that are made on Earth that weren't found on the moon have this sort of exact right pressure and temperature made in the presence of oxygen that, on Earth, you could get it maybe 20 kilometers down, but on the moon, it would have to be hundreds of kilometers down to get those same conditions. And that's why the scientists figured that it came from the Earth and not from the moon. Muthu Krishnan. Hey Fraser, can you explain why the asteroid belt is not formed as a planet? No problem. I, I did a whole episode on this and I'll, I guess I'll put a, a link to it here. But the short answer is that one, the asteroid belt is not as massive as you might think. If you took all of the material that is formed of all the asteroids, all the big Ceres and Vesta and Pallas and all of those, and you put them all together, you would have an object with about 5% the mass of the moon. So I'm sure you were expecting if you put that, all stuff, that stuff all together, you would get another planet like Earth or Mars. But no, it would be a fraction of the mass of the moon. You wouldn't even really call it a planet. You would call it a dwarf planet, right? So that's one of the things is that even if you did pull all that material together, you wouldn't get the kind of world that you're hoping to see. But the reason is because Jupiter. Jupiter is so close to the asteroid belt that its gravity is constantly perturbing the area. And so the, all the various rocks in that area could never come together to form any object. As soon as things started to come together, the gravity of Jupiter came along and broke them all apart again. And as I mentioned earlier in this question show, Jupiter it looks like actually plowed into what used to be a ring of the asteroid belt and scattered all of the pieces and had them slam into other worlds. So uh, that's why we you're not gonna see all of the asteroids form into a planet today or ever. Greg Vandenbosch, 
If laser photons produce acceleration on an object, wouldn't the laser itself be thrust in the opposite direction? So this is a response to the idea of the Project Dragonfly, this idea to use laser power to send a spacecraft to another star. And it's the same thing that would happen with Breakthrough Starshot, right? You've got this enormous laser system that's solar powered, able to generate 100 megawatts of, of laser power and fire that at a target. And the photons, as they strike the reflective material and bounce off of it, impart momentum to the spacecraft, and that's what makes it fly through space. And so, yes, as the laser is emitting photons, which are going to be going through space and striking the solar sail, the laser itself is receiving a kick in the opposite direction, exactly the same amount. But the key is that the laser system is going to be really massive. Think about the solar panels and the trusses and the battery systems and the laser emitters and the all of the pieces of the puzzle that would make this whole system work. It would be an enormous system to be able to shoot a laser that powerful for that long. And yes, it would receive a kick, but the kick that it would receive would be a fraction of the kick that the spacecraft would receive. Now, if your laser system was in orbit around the sun, you could use a solar sail on the laser system to make slight course corrections to bring your laser ray back to the place that you want it to be. Sort of a constant sail that is constantly tacking and keeping your, your laser system exactly where it's supposed to be and counteract that push that's coming from the laser that it's shooting out. And I mentioned in a previous question show, and I'll, I'll probably do an episode about this, right? This is the idea of a photonic propulsion system. And yeah, if you have a very powerful laser and you shoot it for a long period of time, you can impart a thrust on the spacecraft. In fact, you could make your spacecraft go almost the speed of light because the uh, because the photons are being ejected at the speed of light. Now, the problem is you need some kind of power system, some kind of fuel source to be able to run your laser system for days, hours, weeks, months, years, etc. And that's the key. That's always the problem with any of these ideas. You could have a chemical rocket reach uh, relativistic speeds, but you need, an, an, you need to be able to carry enough fuel. And the more fuel you carry, the harder it goes. So, we may very well see photonic systems in the future. And in fact, it's a really cool idea where you, you use them to, for example, for some kind of spacecraft that needs to fly in a formation and you fire your lasers to give you really precise measurement, really precise movements back and forth with your spacecraft in a way that no other uh, chemical rocket or ion drive or anything can provide that level of precision because a laser's push is very, is tiny, but if you do it long enough, you're going to be able to generate a tiny little thrust. And so you could make sure that your, your spacecraft that are flying in formation remain in perfect formation. Anyway, I'm clearly already starting to write this episode in my head. So I will do an episode on photonic propulsion systems coming up soon. I promise. Universe. How do the astronauts manage the scorching heat on the moon? I hear this argument from moon landing deniers often, but I couldn't find the answer. I would assume that NASA had them land on areas that were cooler, but I don't know. Great question. Uh, so don't you wish that if you could just explain the reason, then the people who use these things as evidence to prove a thing that they don't believe would then just agree? Because then they understand the science and then that issue goes away. It doesn't seem to work that, that way. So my best advice if you're going to be having these conversations with people who, who don't believe in evidence is to not have this conversation. You're literally wasting your time. However, allow me to explain it. So spacesuits, right? So one, yes, space is like say on the moon, incredible temperature extremes here on Earth. You can be outside and you can be more than say, oh, I forget the number, 100 and I can't believe I only know this in Fahrenheit, like 170 degrees above Fahrenheit and negative 170 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go, Americans. I, I stuck to Imperial for you. Um, but so that's an incredible temperature range. And when you think about it, say you're, you're on a spacewalk outside the International Space Station and you're having to go between those two extremes, cold and hot and cold and hot. Now, astronauts have a spacesuit. It is literally they're wearing a spacecraft and it has inside of it cooling and heating systems. So they have 
they have when astronauts gear up, they wear a bunch of layers. And one of these is this is this system that is all of these tubes that go around sort of their clothing, and they pump liquid through these tubes to help the astronauts manage their temperature. Like imagine if you were on a really cold day and you instead had a piece of clothing that was like a hot water bottle, but it pushed liquid around your outside of you. It would be like the most comfortable, no matter what temperature you'd be at, it would be amazing. The other thing is that when you're in space, there aren't, there's only one way to lose your temperature and that is through radiation. So in fact, you know, here on Earth, when we go out into cold air, the cold air molecules are bumping up against us and they're taking away our, our heat. If you jump into water, same kind of thing. But in, in space, all the only way that you can lose your heat is through the radiation that you give off, the heat, the infrared radiation that you give off. And that's actually much slower than you would expect. And so it allows spacesuits to be able to handle this transition from day to night etc. When you think about what happened with, say, the astronauts who were on the moon, they didn't have to really think about the, the night stuff being in the dark because all of the time they're going out onto the day side. So it's actually a, a simpler challenge. The spacesuits that the astronauts have to wear for the International Space Station where they do have to be outside and every 90 minutes they're, they're going around the Earth and dealing with day and night and day and night it's a much bigger challenge these days. And they've got these suits that allow them to regulate this temperature. It's pretty amazing. Iman M. Fraser, I'm struggling to understand how did the Big Bang create matter? How does something come from nothing? Where did the Big Bang occur? Well, like, don't feel hard on yourself if you're struggling to understand where everything came from. Nobody knows. The greatest physicists and cosmologists on Earth have no idea where everything came from. Now, they do know that the universe is expanding. And if you take this expansion of the universe and you run this backwards, and we can see, as we look out into space, we can see times when the universe was closer together. We look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, and we see a time when, when everything in the universe was so tightly together that it was sort of like the surface of a star. And you can assume that even before that, everything was closer and closer together. But how did it get to closer and closer together? Like how did it get to that first time when everything was as dense as, as it started out? Nobody knows. Was there a universe before our universe? We don't know. Did the universe come out of a black hole? We don't know, right? We just don't know. And we may never know. And, and so don't worry if you find that troubling that there may very well be questions, scientific questions that we will never know the answer to. And you have to be okay to just say, I don't know. I don't know where it all came from. I, I, and, and appreciate every time anyone, astronomers, scientists, philosophers, anyone thinks about, looks into, observes things about the universe and understands it a little bit more. It's the journey, not the destination. Mark Reedman. If the universe is expanding, is this occurring between galaxies? And if so, how much is occurring between us and Andromeda galaxy affecting its velocity towards us? So the universe is expanding at the largest levels, right? As you look out into the universe, you see the most distant galaxies and in all directions, they are moving away from us. The farther the galaxy is that you see, the faster it's moving away from us. So, and this is this, is this idea of the Big Bang, that the universe is getting less dense over time in all places. But locally, you're going to have situations where things are moving together. So for example, uh, you've got Andromeda, which is coming towards us. And over the next several billion years, it's going to merge with us and form one larger galaxy. And that makes sense. It's like, you know, over the largest scales, it's this expansion that is the dominant actor that's going on. But in the smallest scales, it can be the local gravity. And here, the local gravity between the Milky Way and Andromeda is greater than the expansion that's happening in the universe. But you can imagine some place where two galaxies are the exact right distance apart, where the expansion is carrying them away, but gravity is pulling them together and they hang 
at this perfect balance away from each other as the rest of the universe speeds away from each other you've got these two galaxies that are just in this perfect balance and then all the other galaxies that are at a greater distance they're going to be pulling away all the galaxies that are at a closer distance they're going to pull together and form blobs but the blobs will be carried away by this expansion of the universe kenny Bob Lazar has worked on reverse engineering alien spacecraft that use a stable form of element 115 in a reactor to create a matter-antimatter collision that generates a gravity wave. The gravity waves are amplified and tunneled through the bottom of the craft into three cylindrical openings that can move and pivot around to create various gravity formations like the omega formation or the delta formation. These gravity wells create a distortion in space in front of the craft and the craft falls forward. This is something like warp speed. There are many documentaries on YouTube explaining this. That's awesome. I can't wait to fly in one of these things. Elementus. If the flares on a red dwarf can easily remove the atmosphere of Earth like planets in its habitable zone, could a habitable moon survive if it was orbiting a Jupiter-like planet with a strong magnetic field or would the planet's magnetic field create too much radiation for life to survive on the moon? So we talked about this, this idea of habitability on red dwarf stars, right? So red dwarf stars in the early ages send out these enormous mega flares that would wipe out the, any life on a planet that was in the habitable zone around that star. But some of these stars can be more active, some of them can be less. It depends on their composition, it depends on their rotation rate, depends on their magnetic fields, depends on their level of activity and their age. There's a ton of variables. And then same thing, you can imagine a giant planet that is orbiting one of these these stars uh, and the very you know and it may have a magnetic field Jupiter has an incredibly strong magnetic field but Saturn which is not quite as large as Jupiter has 1 20th the magnetic field that Jupiter has so again you're gonna have to deal with like some could have incredibly strong magnetic fields some could have fairly weak magnetic fields and who knows if you were at Jupiter and you were uh, say on Io or Europa, you would receive a lethal dose of radiation because of the trapped radiation that's around Jupiter. Within a very short period of time, Jupiter is terrible. But if you were on a moon around Saturn, it wouldn't be the same situation. So, like, you can't come up with any... Right now, we don't know are there any hard and fast rules. If you measure the size of a planet, do you know how big its magnetic field is? Do you know if it's going to wipe out life on any of its moons? It could be that the planet, if the moons are close enough, the planet's magnetosphere could protect them. Or maybe the magnetosphere could sort of continues to bombard them after the flares have gone off of the planet. So more research is necessary. Matthew Grotke. It's winter. How are you standing outside with a light sweater? So as many of you know, I'm Canadian, uh, but I live on the west coast of Canada, which is like the Florida of Canada. And so our temperatures don't actually get that cold, except right now. It is really cold outside right now, and so I'm filming inside um, because it's just way too cold. And uh, But we as Canadians, uh, on the West Coast are not permitted to complain about cold temperatures because for us, cold is freezing. While for the rest of Canada, cold can be things like minus 40 Celsius. It's awful. So, uh, yeah. And so that's why it's pretty warm here. It just rains a lot. Like it rains and it rains and it rains and it rains. We have sometimes month long precipitation every single day. So it's the weather in the wintertime can get just, it's just wet and dreary, but not very cold. And so I'm able to shoot outside. It's actually sometimes really hard for us to shoot outside because we need to wait for the rain to stop a time that I can then go stand outside. We don't have to worry about too much direct sunlight. It's just that it's raining all the time. And sometimes I just shoot out in the rain. Right now though, it's snow, very cold, surprisingly cold, uh, but I'm sure it'll warm up very soon. Keith and ADHD. If we're contacted by aliens and they send us a view of the cosmic background radiation as they see it, would we be able to find their location using that data? So the cosmic microwave radiation that I mentioned is a is personal, right? If you wherever you are on Earth, you're looking out in space and you see the cosmic microwave background, it is a personal radiation that you see by all of the particles that just happen to be uh, at the point where they released their energy. 13.8 billion years ago, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. 
And if you go to a different location and you look up, you're going to see a different cosmic microwave background. But the cosmic microwave background maps to the large scale structures in the universe. And so if you look out far into space and you see a gigantic galaxy cluster, you can actually see that galaxy cluster mapped onto the cosmic microwave background. It's like the, the over densities in the background led to these gigantic galaxy clusters that we that we see at the earliest times in the universe, and then everything evolves from there. So if you're anywhere in the Milky Way, and you produce an image of the cosmic microwave background, the Milky Way is really small. And so you're probably going to you're going to generate essentially the exact same map that we see here on Earth. It's only if you go far enough away that you're starting to see a different structure of galaxy clusters than what we do. I can imagine if aliens, say a billion light years away, were able to send us a map, and we looked at the map, and we could sort of figure out how it's our cosmic microwave background, but shifted a little bit, so that other structures are maybe mapped onto this background. I'll bet you we could figure it out, but then they're a billion light years away, so we can't really communicate. The, the more effective thing that people could do is use pulsars, right? We know that, that pul you know, the pulsars are very regular, very specific, and we can see them around the Milky Way. And you can imagine, a, and on the, the Voyager spacecraft, they included a map of pulsars. So if someone wants to track Earth back, they can just follow this map. And you can imagine eventually, you know, they know where they are because of those pulsars and they could find us here. So pulsars are the way to do it, not the cosmic microwave background. But theoretically, I guess, yeah. Quinton Kravacek. Why is NASA using both of the SpaceX Crew Dragon and the Boeing Starliner? Do they both have unique capabilities to accomplish specific mission goals, or is it just to increase launch frequency? Great question, and I am going to call in a ringer, somebody who thinks about and talks about SpaceX and Boeing and various uh, crewed vehicles all the time, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Take it away, Tim. That's a really good question, Quentin. And it's not necessarily so much about specific mission goals, because they're both basically, for now, at least under NASA's direction, just going to be sending crew uh, up to the International Space Station. So their mission is, is virtually the same. Um, and as far as launch frequency, there's not a lot <laughs> of demand for this. I mean, there's only three or four flights typically going to the ISS per year. So it's not like one company wasn't capable of doing that anyway. So really, this all stems back way back in the day. Uh, I mean, this is going on for well over a decade. Um, it started off with kind of the commercial crew development program, um, the CC, CC Dev. And then there is, as that evolved, because that started off with just sending up cargo with the CRS missions. And uh, as we may be aware, that's why this uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule as it exists. Now the Dragon 1 uh, won those contracts and has been fulfilling that. But also there was um, Orbital ATK, now Northrop Grumman. Um, they also won part of the, the commercial resupply contracts as well. But then that moves into like CC Dev 1 and all these CC Dev 2s. Uh, it kind of kept going and kept going until we get down to um, the commercial crew uh, integrated capability. This is when NASA actually decided who is going to send our next astronauts to space. And they actually had proposals all together from seven different companies. This included Sierra Nevada Corporations with their Dream Chaser, which did end up winning a round uh, for cargo only for the uh, commercial resupply contract two or three now or whatever the next one is. Uh, that that got so Sierra Nevada will be flying the Dream Chaser, but they originally wanted to fly humans. Uh, there's also ATK had a Liberty capsule. Uh, there's also proposals that weren't even selected from space operations. Uh, American Aerospace Space Design Corporation, which I'm not too familiar with any of those. I actually need to look into this more myself. But basically what happened was uh, there's three that were really seriously uh, competitive. And it ended up being um, SpaceX, Boeing, and Sierra Nevada. And they basically had to put their best foot forward. They both had to bring out uh, you know, their, their best proposals and make it as inexpensive as they could offer, you know, the best variety of, of different things. Cause NASA basically said, we want it to do X, Y, and Z or whatever, you know, had a list of requirements, including, you know, capability, how long it needs to stay on orbit, how redundant, how safe, how blah, 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 how, et cetera, et cetera. And it was up to these companies then to make sure that they had the best proposals. 
And uh, after some serious review, NASA selected SpaceX and Boeing uh, due to who a variety of things, but mostly it seems like they were the most capable, um, simple and safe and uh, hopefully inexpensive. Although um, SpaceX won a lot less money than Boeing did for the actual contracts once they both got selected, which is interesting. Um, but that being said, it's, so it's not necessarily so much about launch frequency, but it is a good idea to have a backup now. So now we have two completely unique systems, which have no like common parts at all between the two of them. And once we are independent again in the United States to be able to launch our own crew and, and, and crew from around the world as well, um, we're probably going to try to wean ourselves off the Soyuz capsule. We've been trying to do that actually for some time here in the United States. Um, and quite frankly, once we have an independent, uh, two different versions, it offers up more reliability as far as being able to say something they see like an anomaly or something they need to tweak. They need to stand down on a program after the space shuttle had failures. Unfortunately, they were both uh, catastrophes. It, they would stand down for years, like two years. And this way we ensure that say a program has to stand down to, to look over something or, you know, tweak some things here and there. At least we still have the other provider solely able to still carry out missions. So it's just really about reliability it's about backups. It's about uh, competitiveness and making sure that they were competing to make the best spacecraft possible at the lowest price point possible, too. So um, putting a little bit of the weight of the development on the shoulders of the company. So pretty cool. It's, it's, I'm really excited because we're finally getting to the point where this is going to be happening. And the, of course, since these are private programs, they also have the ability not only to, to service NASA missions to the International Space Station, but they can even service private missions to future commercial space stations and things like that. So it's a really exciting time. 2019 is going to be awesome seeing both of those vehicles fly, hopefully with people on them for sure by the end of the year. I, I really hope so. And it's going to be awesome. I hope that answers your question. Thanks for having me on here, Fraser. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people. All right. Thanks, Tim. That was awesome. Uh, if you haven't already, I highly recommend you check out Tim's channel. I'll put a link in the show notes and up here somewhere. Uh, and I really have been enjoying bringing on more guest answerers. So let me know if you still like that. Let me know if there are some other guest answerers that you'd like to see here, and I will be glad to reach out to them. All right. So thanks again, everyone who sent in their questions. Special thanks to Tim for tackling that last question. As always, anywhere you're on my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down on any video. I will gather a bunch of them up and I'll answer them here. And I'll see you next week.